time for another A Push with Lennox. That's right, AP US History with Lennox, and we're in review mode. And today we're going to look at the War of 1812 and the era of good feelings. Can you feel the excitement? So let's get started. When we talk about the era of good feelings in the War of 1812, we're going back to the early 1800s. And prior to the War of 1812 getting started, America was struggling to stay out of the conflicts of Europe. Jefferson had been president, and while he was president over in Europe, France was at war against everybody. See, the monarchies of Europe had banded together after the French Revolution because they didn't want to see a revolution in their neck of the woods. So they said, let's go ahead and put this one down, meaning the French Revolution, and then we don't have to worry about it help happening over here. Well, what's going to happen is that war is going to grow. Napoleon's going to come in and take over for France, and now he has sights on all of Europe. Well, throughout this time, both Europe or England and France has been messing with America. They've been impressing our sailors on the high seas. They've been, you know, blocking off our trade routes. The English have been inciting the Native Americans on the Western frontier. And you had this group of war hawks, people like John C. Calhoun and um, Henry Clay, who were calling for Jefferson, first Adams, and then Jefferson to say, hey, we got to go to war, declare war against Great Britain. Well, it doesn't happen. In fact, what Jefferson does is he kind of tries to cut us off from the rest of the world by passing the Embargo Act of 1807, which totally cremates our economy over here. And so then when James Madison comes in, he's inherited all those problems. It's all gonna come to head at the Battle of Tippecanoe. It's at that battle that William Henry Harrison defeats Tecumseh and finds out after the battle that it's been the English that had been arming the Native Americans on the Western frontier. This is when Madison declares war against England. And this is where we're picking up today. Now, the first thing I want you guys to do, again, I'm sorry, is take a look at this list. This list is all the terms you need to know for this time period. If you already know the term, you don't have to do anything with it. You know it. But if you don't know it, what I want you to do, take a minute, pause this video, write down the terms you don't know, and then use that as your notes as I go through this presentation. It's a short presentation, so you'll be able to get the information you need. So let's start with the War of 1812, which didn't start off very good for the United States. In fact, we weren't prepared for it. We didn't have a strong enough military, and our nation was divided, believe it or not. The New England was very upset with the Embargo Act of 1807, and even when Madison tried to pass the Non-Intercourse Act or make its Bill Number 2 was passed, it wasn't enough to save their economy. So now we're getting ready to go to war with England, and they want nothing to do with it. So they take this stance as, you know what, we'll use our militias and we'll defend our state, but the rest of you guys, on your own. So here we are divided already. One thing the Warhawks wanted to do in this war was get Canada. I mean, they had these, these visions of grandeur. This was their American Revolution. And so they thought, we can just go take Canada from England, and then we're going to have all of North America. Didn't quite work out that way. Things really got bad during the War of 1812 when England invaded Washington, D.C. and actually started to burn it down. Um, the White House was set on fire. And if it not for Dolly Madison, we would have lost a lot of national you know, historical treasures. But she stayed behind and got a lot of that stuff out, it's including the very famous picture of George Washington standing by the globe. But when the, what happened with Washington when it was burning – it was the weather that kind of brought it to an end. The, a hurricane came through the region, and that basically stopped the fighting, and that's what saved Washington, D.C. Otherwise, England would have burnt it to the ground. The Battle of Fort McHenry is a huge battle that you should be familiar with in the War of 1812. It's at this battle that Francis Scott Key writes his poem, The Star-Spangled Banner, which will become our national anthem in the 1900s. Key was being held captive on a ship in the harbor during the Battle of Fort McHenry. And as the, ba the bombs went off through the night and you couldn't see anything, at, at dawn's early light, he saw the American flag still flying, which meant we had won the battle and we were on the way to winning the war. But that's kind of a misunderstanding of this war because we didn't really win it. In fact, it was just kind of fought to a tie. 
we got to the point with England where we both said, we're kind of done. We were tired of fighting. And so at the Treaty of Ghent, when they were negotiating terms to end the war, they basically both agreed to go to what we call antebellum status quo. Let's just go back to the way it was before the war. Like it never happened. And so that was signed. And that was December 24th, 1814. Well, believe it or not, in 1812 or 1814, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have internet, so it took time for information to get across the ocean. Well, in the weeks that it took for the terms of the Treaty of Ghent to reach the United States, a whole bunch of stuff started happening. The first thing happened in January, the first week of January down in New Orleans, a man by the name of Andrew Jackson had assembled his army and he went to battle with England and totally kicked their butt. And word started spreading throughout the nation about the Battle of New Orleans. And you got to remember, war wasn't going that well for America. So when you hear about this major victory down in New Orleans, people started celebrating. And then they hear about the treaty. So they kind of tie the two together like, oh, we won the Battle of New Orleans. Oh, the Treaty of Ghent. We must have won the War of 1812. And that's why if you ask a lot of people today, they'll say, yeah, the United States won that war. We're 0-2 or we're 2-0 against England right now. Ooh, yay, America. Other stuff was happening, though, because there were people that weren't too happy with what was going on with the war. Those people came from New England, and that was the Federalists. Right towards the end of uh, 1814, the Federalists call a convention up in Hartford. And there they discussed what needed to be changed with the government. And they had some proposals for amendments to the Constitution. Some of these amendments included, um, you had to have two-thirds majority to institute a tax, a two-thirds majority to declare war. This is a majority within Congress. And these are the kind of ideas they were coming up with. Well, there were some radical members of this convention who said, you know what? We're losing this war. And if they need our help, what we'll do is we'll threaten to secede from the union unless they accept our amendments. That way, you know, when we go down there, they're thinking, dude, we're losing. So why don't we get them to accept our amendments? Then we'll agree to fight with them. That will be the end of the war. And everybody will be happy with the Federalists. Well, that's not what happened. Because if you remember correctly, um, the Federalists, or, or, or what I told you just a few minutes ago, we had already won the war. We had a treaty. And this treaty comes across at, right as the Federalists are present, presenting their ideas to Congress. And Congress is like, why do we need you? We've already ended the war. So all of this is kind of mute. This cartoon right here really captures the idea of the Hartford Convention. It was this, and this is how people started to view the Federalists. You had these states or these people in these states, representing these states, who said, we're leaving. We're going to secede from the Union. And the one place they're going to go? Back to England. And we just, won, we just finished a war with England. So the Federalists are kind of seen as traitors to our Union at this point. And so the Hartford Convention is actually going to be the end of the, or the beginning of the end of the Federalist Party. It's at this point that we go into the era of good feelings. Because... With the victory at New Orleans, tied that to the Treaty of Ghent and the, the perception that we won this war, this idea of nationalism just spreads throughout our country. This, I'm proud to be an American, idea becomes reality, and it unifies our country. James Monroe is going to be elected president in 1816, and he's going to reap the rewards of this feeling of nationalism in our country. But not everything was really good in our country. The area of good feelings is this umbrella that kind of shadows some of the stuff that was going on that wasn't so good. Number one, sectionalism was growing during this time. And now it's just not North and South. It's the North, the South, and the West. You have this debate over this new economic plan for our country called the American system. And there was debates between the sections because it absolutely benefited people in the Northeast and it benefited people in the West, but the South didn't get a whole lot out of it. And the South was still dealing with slavery and that question of, of, of slavery and the spread of it became another topic of debate. And then economically, we're gonna have some, some bumps along the road. The panic of 1819 is going to occur, and that's going to occur primarily because Americans are starting to move west, and lands are going to become available for sale, and people are going to start speculating on land sales, and what that primarily means is they're buying land at what they think is a cheap price, thinking they'll be able to turn it over very quickly for a higher price and make a quick profit. 
Well, the land didn't hold the value. So they went and they bought all this land, then they couldn't sell it for the price they needed and they defaulted on their loans. And when that happened, banks started closing. And when banks start closing, businesses start closing following that. And we go into an economic panic. And that's what happened in 1819. But because of this era of good feelings, because of this sweep of nationalism, Monroe is not going to be held responsible for the economy going into the election of 1820. Pretty much the only time this has happened in history. And if you look at this map right here, there was nobody running against him. In fact, notice there is no Federalist Party anymore. You have John Quincy Adams that's running as an independent Republican, but we are a one party country at this point going into the 1820s. Let's talk a little bit about the American system because this was a point of contention in our country. It was introduced by Henry Clay during Madison's presidency, and it was an economic plan for our country to move forward. It had three parts. It had a new national bank, it had infrastructure or internal improvements, and it had a tariff system. Now, the Bank of the United States, the original Bank of the United States, created by Alexander Hamilton during Washington's presidency, had expired. I don't know if you remember, but when that bank was introduced, Thomas Jefferson and Madison and others were against it. And as part of a, of a compromise, they agreed to accept Hamilton's financial plan that included the bank in exchange for getting Washington, D.C. to become the new capital because that would put the capital of the country in the southern states. But that bank had expired because there was only a 20-year term on that. Well, now Madison, who had been against that one, is pushing for a second national bank because we need that for credit for our, our country. We also need it for economic stability. So that's going to go through. You're going to have this push for internal improvements or infrastructure, the idea to build canals and roads to help connect our country. This was a very big point of contention because it only was going to benefit the West and the North. There was no real infrastructure plan for the South. So while you had senators and congressmen from the North and the West, and the West supporting this, the South was kind of left out. Um, and on top of that, both Madison and Monroe as presidents are going to veto this part of the American system because they don't think that infrastructure should be the responsibility of the federal government. They think it should be part of the state government's responsibility and the states should pay for it. So when the internal improvements are not going to be improved or or approved, you're going to see states start to take the lead. So New York is going to build the Erie Canal. Maryland is going to start building the Cumberland Road. And so it's going to be state projects that build this infrastructure. <clears throat> and then finally, the tariff of 1816. We have had tariffs on, Amer on, on imports coming into our country since Hamilton and Washington's presidency. This one's a little bit different. This is what we call a protective tariff. And the purpose of this tariff was to protect American industry. I said on a previous presentation, I'll say it on this one. The biggest effect of the War of 1812 and you know, going back to the Embargo Act of 1807 is American self-sufficiency. We are now taking our own raw materials and manufacturing them here in our country. This is going to be what this tariff of 1816 is all about. It's going to put a tax on manufactured goods that are coming from foreign countries. And the purpose of that tax is to make those goods more expensive. So Americans have the choice now between buying American made goods or buying European goods, but having to pay extra for that tariff. And the idea is that Americans will probably buy American-made manufactured goods, thereby driving up our American industries. So this is the first protective tariff that we have in our country's history, and that's going to be something that we're going to use over and over and over again. Politically, the Missouri Compromise is going to become a major topic of debate in our country. See, Missouri wanted to come into our country as a slave state. And up until this point, we really hadn't had any laws with regards to slavery, with the exception of the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 had established that that Northwest Territory would be slave-free but it didn't talk about any place else in the country. Well, now we have the Louisiana Territory and Missouri wants to come in as a slave state. 
Well, there's going to be a pushback against that. And you have to understand at this point, it's not about the question of the morality of slavery. It's about power in the Congress, specifically the Senate. At this point in history, you have an equal division between senators from slave states and senators from free states. And no one wants the other side to have the advantage. Put it in terms of the American system. The American system was highly beneficial to the North. The American system was highly beneficial to the West. If there was something that would give the Southern voters or the Southern side more power or more votes, that the American system, particularly the bank and the tariff, could have been voted out, would not have passed. So power, voting power in the Senate is very important. So when Missouri wants to come in as a slave state, a compromise is going to be reached. This compromise is introduced by Henry Clay, who's known as the Great Compromiser. And it's basically going to say that Missouri can come in as a slave state as long as Maine can come in as a free state. That's going to be accepted. Now, there had been some ideas leading up to it. The Talmadge Amendment had suggested just letting Missouri come in as a free state but ha or a slave state, but allowing for gradual emancipation. But again, it wasn't about the slavery question. It was about power in Congress. So the Missouri Compromise is going to be passed, and it's also going to look to the future. It's going to set this, this boundary, this 3630 line, and you can see it in the, right here in the screen here, this line right here. And basically what it said was from this point on, for the Louisiana Territory, every state that comes in above or north of that line will be a free state. Every state that comes in beneath or south of that line will be a slave state. This compromise is going to be accepted by both houses of Congress. It will be passed and signed into law by uh, President Monroe. And it's going to subside the tensions between the regions temporarily. Because let's face it, this was just a Band-Aid on sectionalism in our country. It didn't solve the problem. Uh, one big thing domestically you have to understand is, is Marshall's court was in session. In 1803, we had Marbury v. Madison, which established the rule of judicial review, that the, co or that the, the um, Supreme Court had the power to determine the constitutionality of laws, and that increased the power of the judicial branch. During this time period, two key cases are going to be decided by the Supreme Court. The first one is McCulloch v. Maryland, which ruled that states do not have the power to tax federal agencies. And then later, Gibbons v. Ogden, where, which said that only the federal government can regulate trade between the states. And Marshall in that court is going to use the Commerce Clause as backing for that, because the Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate interstate trade, not intrastate trade, intrastate, I-N-T-R-A, state trade. That's trade within a state. That means there's, there's nothing that goes out beyond the borders of that state. State governments still control that, but interstate trade, I-N-T-E-R, that's trade between the states, that's governed by the federal government. Now here's the deal. All of these rulings by John Marshall and his court made the federal government stronger, made it bigger, and it basically set the standard that federal laws will always take precedence over state laws. Now let's go back a little bit in history, back when Madison and Jefferson were writing the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. In those resolutions, they argued that states had the power to deem laws that were not good for them or beneficial for them states as, and, and, and as unconstitutional and nullify those laws. Here, Marshall is saying, you don't have that power. That's ridiculous. Federal law will always trump state law. And this becomes the norm for our country. Finally, foreign policy. How are we getting along with other countries? Let's be honest. We haven't had the best track record with foreign countries up to this point. But we're still young. We're still babies. And so Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams, is going to come in. And he's actually going to build stability with foreign affairs in our country. John Quincy Adams, not the greatest president really probably one of the worst, but really good Secretary of State. As Secretary of State, he's going to negotiate two agreements, one with England, one with Spain. 
The first one is going to be at the Anglo-American Convention. If you remember, Lewis and Clark reached the Oregon Territory, which means America thought the Oregon Territory should be ours. Well, England claimed it as well. At the Anglo-American Convention, what's going to happen is we're going to agree with England to jointly occupy the Oregon Territory. We're going to share it for 10 years. And we're also going to establish officially the northern border of the Louisiana Territory to be the 49th parallel. That's how Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota, that's how they got their lines, their, their borders. Is that's in, you know, it was the Anglo-American Convention. Now, the adams onis Treaty that we negotiate with Spain is we are going to negotiate and get Florida from Spain, and in exchange, we're going to give up any claim we might have in the Texas region. You see, when we got the Louisiana Territory, there were some questions about boundaries and borders there, and we thought we should have gotten a little bit more land into what we call Texas today, and Spain's like, no, it's ours. And the adams onis Treaty is going to settle that. They're going to be like, Here's Florida, and we're going to say, okay, here's Texas, and that solves that. And so that kind of calms the waters and stabilizes our relationships in the world. But we're not done. We're really worried about European colonizers coming back. You see, up until 1813, 1814, they've been busy with this war against France. Now that war's over, and European countries are looking out saying, where can we colonize? Well, we don't want them over here. And so we're going to issue the Monroe Doctrine, also written by John Quincy Adams. And what we said here is we don't want any European colonization efforts to happen in the Western Hemisphere. And we warn Europe, stay out of our territory, stay out of the Western Hemisphere. And in exchange, we'll stay out of your affairs. We're not going to get involved in any of your you know, domestic issues over there in Europe. Well, Honestly, you would have to think that that's pretty, you know, brazen of the United States. I mean, we're only, what, 20, you know, 30 years old at this point as a country, maybe a little bit older compared to these countries that have been around for, you know, centuries. And we're telling them, stay out of our business. Here's the kicker. England liked the idea. England didn't want any European colonizers over here. So they're kind of like backing us up on this. And if you look at this cartoon, you can see Monroe there saying, hey, you guys can't come over here, but look who's standing behind him. One of the strongest militaries in the world, Great Britain. So it's kind of like Big Brother standing behind us, you know, and you're not going to mess with us that way. The impact of the Monroe Doctrine, very little, you know, in the 1820s, 1830s. When it's going to come into play, 1890s, during this, that age of imperialism, and we're going to get involved with Spain once again with regards to Cuba and Latin America. So while the Monroe Doctrine doesn't play a key or vital role in you know, foreign politics in the early 1800s, by the late 1800s, 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, Monroe Doctrine, big player. Okay. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this presentation. Hopefully I answered your questions. As always, if you have any questions, just post them down below in the comment section. I'll try to get them answered for you. Other than that, we will catch you on the other side. Have a great day. Bye-bye.